All right, continuing here to finish my thought about females. I really think that um, men need to um, really do their very best to take the high road in the relationship between the genders. And what I mean by that is we need to continue to vaunt them and to lift them and let them have more say-so in the way things are run. We've all got to recognize men do that they have a feminine side and they can understand the heart and the mind of females. And when they do, they will be sensitive to them much more. And this is going to make the female of the species happier, that we understand what it's like to be a female. Okay? I think that's very important to women, to, to, to be well-adjusted, and to be, uh, you know, of sound mind, they need to know that men understand them. And I don't feel like women are feeling that too much that today. They really, you know, a lot of men are just out of touch. They just think like a man, and they don't bother thinking about like a woman. What's that like? What are her difficulties? What's it like? What would it be like? I mean, man, this is just, you know, walking a mile in my shoes kind of thing. This is this goes back to the teachings of Christ, the two new commandments he gave us. Treat others the way you want to be treated, the golden rule, right? So in order to treat others the way you want to be treated, you got to kind of put yourself in their position, in their shoes, in their circumstances. So if you were a woman, how do you want to be treated? And if you can conclude, well, I know how I'd want to be treated if I was a woman, like a queen, like a princess, okay, like the precious treasure they all are, right, because that's the natural law, that's the natural order, that's the feminine of the species, that is what it's all about, every man has been coming out of a woman for how long now, since the first man was created by the hand of God out of the dust of the earth? I mean, this is incredible what we're a part of here. But the female, I mean, this is why I say, I mean, that um, while it's true that, uh, you know, a woman without a man is akin to a fish without a bicycle to ride, you know, it's, well, she can, you know, live without it probably just fine, right? I mean, how many fish really want to bite? It might be fun. But men, on the other hand, they are like fish without an ocean to swim in when it comes to a man without a woman, okay? Behind every successful man is what? What have we heard through the ages? A woman. I mean, it's a big deal. I mean, that is power, okay? The, a woman has the most power. That's the, that's the paradigm, and that's the recognition that we need to give the female is that she has the power to literally extinct our species. As she says, that's it. No more relations. She has that power. And we know the evidence shows us this is, I mean, women, I mean, they're out there. They have all this self-control, apparently. I mean, how many men are prostitutes? I mean, you know there's a handful of gigolos out there that can make it. You've got to be young and strong and potent and all that stuff probably handsome and everything else. I don't know what women are looking for in their gigolo. I don't know. Uh, there's $2 gigolos. Maybe, oh, I, are you kidding me? I mean, if a woman wants to get laid, she's, you know, come on. Come on. There, there's guys, you go to any bar, they're drooling over half a dozen or more guys or leering at her and you'd love to take her home tonight. So, you know, women, you know, I mean, come on, just looking at the empirical evidence of what I'm trying to get it convey here to men, that they they run the show. They really are boss, whether we admit it or not. They, that's it. That's, that's the pattern. That's the paradigm. That's just the way it is, baby, that the women are the boss and they decide whether our species continues or not, whether a man ever has sex again or not. They've got more self-control than us. It's a bigger deal. I mean, if you were a woman... You know, I mean, you could get pregnant. I mean, some women, their frame is so small, you think, God almighty, if I was her, as petite as that woman, I, I, I sure as hell don't want to push a, a baby out of me, okay? You, you understand? I mean, men need to think about these things. What's going on in her mind? What is it like to be a woman? 
How do you want to be treated? Guys, you can figure it out by just being a woman. I mean, you know, that's it. God will allow you to understand that. And women, conversely, they too can spend some time understanding what it's like to be a man. I mean, you know, we, we, we have a hard time. I mean, we're simple beings. I really think we are simple animals. But you know what? We're driven. We've got issues. Uh, we're all very frustrated. We got this. We got this testosterone, and we we got the adrenaline, and we don't know if it's good or bad or what the hell. You know, from down half the time, uh, men are lost without a woman. I mean, they, they they need a woman like they need a nurse, or they need a mother, or they need a girlfriend, or they need a wife. They need a housekeeper. They need it all. Babysitter. I mean, they need a cook. The freaking men are are, are huge freaking babies. And this is a good reason why women should let a man have time on his own. I mean, not saying, all, you know, don't abandon us, ladies. But you know what? It's good for guys to know what it's like to keep a clean toilet. Right now, I've probably got one of the cleanest toilets in town. I just, you know, I've, but I've evolved. I've learned that I like a clean toilet. And any, any lady going to sit her pretty behind on my toilet, you know, it's sterile. And that's the way I like it, you know. But uh, guys, they don't think that, that often. I mean, how many guys are good housekeepers? I, I dust. I mean, it, you know, what's it with the gut dust, huh, guys? Every freaking day, it's like, what? I just dusted there, you know? Or, or, you know, even if you leave something for a week in some obscure corner, it's like, where in the dust? Where's it coming from? And it's not from your skin cell. I know. There may be some limited amount, of course, is, is that. But you know what? What we've got is cosmic dust. Every day, there's some 60 tons of cosmic dust falling to the earth. That's bound to get in somehow to your house. Okay, every time you open the door, you can let in a little cosmic dust and it's spreading around. You know, even, even the winter, right, you're gonna get a degree of that if it's not raining, but more so in the summer, of course, there's dust, it's coming from the roads, people driving their car, it's getting stirred up in the breezes. So we're getting our share of dust in the house, but I hate it, you know, so. That, to me, is organic suffering. Somehow, God's going to have to get rid of dust, too, because it's just too much of a hassle. And I think, uh, you know, the idea of creating a robot that's going to go around dust in your house is, well, that might be a ways off, because that, uh, that would be a very complex little flying robot, probably. But I'm not saying it's beyond the realm of possibility, but beyond my realm of inventing. But uh, I'd like to see it, sure, just set the little drone loose and it goes around with a little camera and uh, there you go. Just came up with another innovation. But uh, listen, exalt the female, let her know what she's worth, let everybody know what they're worth. I mean, I, I tell people, you go, these homeless people in your community, go find somebody. Don't, don't be picky, even if they look mean or angry or hostile or whatever. I mean, you can approach them and find out if they look dangerous, and that's it. But, I mean, people that are neglected, they can turn into what is like animals. you got to understand, they get pride, too. And, 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 and they get downtrodden, you understand? And they disheartened, disenfranchised. So, you know, if you can spare a few bucks, why don't you go and give it to one of these guys or the group of them standing around, just spread it around. And more importantly, tell them you love them. This is something we can all do. So we've all got to be start living like a family. If we want the wrath that's hanging so heavy over America and the rest of this planet by extension, okay, and it has to do with our love of money. I'm telling you, friends, we're in trouble. We're paying way too much attention, heed to the money lovers and the money money system of satanic money system, okay? This false god, this competing god, okay? And we're not paying enough to the one true god. And that's, we've got to start doing that and just start shaking in our shoes and say, God help me. I mean, it, we're, we're in trouble. I'm, where is it going to stop? Don't you care about your fellow human being? What's going to happen on Judgment Day? Why should God care about you? Maybe he's just like you. It don't, nothing personal. It's just business. And, you know, so I didn't live by the golden rule for this reason, that reason. So you get to go to, you know, Dante's Inferno-like place. And, you know, that's it. Until you learn whatever you got to learn. I don't know. God's probably never going to give up on even the most wicked of men. Maybe maybe Hitler someday will be. I don't know. I have no idea who repented on their deathbed and God's going to save and give a room above yours in heaven so it's important to do what jesus said love your enemy from your heart you might have to kill him i'm not saying being a dumbass 
I might have to get killed myself in protecting innocent men, women, and children. That's the cost we all have to pay, being just good kids of God and good friends to humanity by extension. And we're protectors, men particularly, or defenders and protectors of innocent men, women, and children. It's just what we do. It's instinct-like. And um, we die and, and we can kill, you know, like Moses did, and you know, not like King David did, for God's sake. I mean, that was as premeditated as it got. What he did to Uriah the Hyatite, you know, that was very tricky uh, when he put him on the front lines knowing, you know, 99.99% Uriah the Hyatite ain't coming home to his wife. And because King David wanted his wife Bathsheba. Oh, well, that's about as evil as it gets, guys, you know. King David. So if you believe in capital punishment, you would have put King David to death for sure. For sure. No equivocation, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So we all got to um, get along and treat each other like family. And giving these guys a little love, that's it. It's just let them know you love them. You know, that's more important than giving them a few bucks. Let them know that you, you empathize, okay? And they appreciate it. They really do. I mean, you might be, you know, you might be the one trigger, the one spark that ignites a flame in them that says, you know what? Okay, I don't like this life. I know that I'm capable of doing some work. I, I know somehow I can get a job. God help me. And they direct their paths. And they're able somehow, by the grace of God, to be the squeaky wheel, go out there and get some help, you know, somehow, and, and get off the street. Well, we've got innocent men, women, and children. Our brothers and sisters are suffering needlessly. Needlessly. That's an absolute term. It's either needed or it's not. It's either necessary or it's unnecessary. It can't be both. So what I'm saying is, is we're allowing this, we're tolerating this, we're accepting our fellow human beings, our weaker brothers and sisters to suffer totally, entirely, undeniably, unnecessarily out in the cold and sometimes dying. That's what we're tolerating. And we're going to justify that for Tim of our God. And you're not going to be trembling in your shoes. I am. I am. And thank God, I really think the rubber, I mean, I, all signs are, Governor Newsom is a badass, and he, he's got you-know-whats, and uh, hey, praise God. That's all I can say. If he really does something, it's at the hand, the finger, the power of God working through that man, and he's got my vote. If he does something tangible to fix the problems because there's fixes my friends to all of our problems that's what you fundamentally got to understand but there is a whole juggernaut of evil people that do not want our problems fixed and they're on both sides of the aisle my friends in politics there are democrats and republicans that don't want they they call themselves socialists but how they won't bring up section 8 housing you see that i mean I don't even call myself a socialist, and I'll bring that. That's a socialistic program. Let's talk about that. Where are these capitalists calling them out on that, saying, well, you know, this is, a, see, the capitalists, too, all those claiming to be capitalists, they're anti-capitalists. They're all liars and deceivers. They think they're smarter than you and I. They're going to keep pulling the wool over our eyes indefinitely, forever, in perpetuity. You understand? If we allow this, we deserve what we get. The amount of tyranny you live under is the amount you tolerate, the amount you accept. That's why you can't do nothing. Or you're culpable. It's that simple. We're all stuck between a rock and a hard spot. And only God can give us what we need, the power thereof, to do what we have to do to be a part of solving the problems. Because really, they don't want the problem solved. They've got to keep poverty in place. Especially the kind that leaves people with utter abject fear. That drives the crime. I mean, homicides. Does crime get any more serious than homicides? Innocent people dying for a few bucks working at a convenience store? I worked at a 7-Eleven. I could have got my head blown off for a few bucks if I had resisted. Of course, I never got robbed and I never would have resisted, but I didn't work at that job that long because eventually the odds are you're going to get robbed and it's very frightening to be at the other end of a gun. The only time that ever happened to me was at the uh, police uh, rifles of... Uh, 
going back to the 80s, uh, was with my, uh, at that time, just my girlfriend, but uh, later to be wife, sitting in my old van in 1963, uh, 40 Connelline van in front of this. It was a shopping center, strip mall place, Albertsons or Lucky's or something. And and then there was a liquor store that we were parked near, but it's all just to, you know, public parking, you know, for the stores and stuff. And um, we were parked there. We were, I think, eating something. And uh, these cops come running around the corner and they um, pointed 